Welcome to episode 34 of the Future of Healthcare podcast. You guys, welcome back, everybody, to the Future Healthcare podcast. Today, I have with me Dr. Fred O'Shang. Yes. And I am so excited for you to join us here and just share your stories and everything you're working on. But just to start, uh, introduce, introduce yourself to the future healthcare audience to kind of let them know mm -hmm. uh, what you're doing here in St. Louis. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Frederick Otieno Ochieng. Um, I am currently a 30-year cardiology fellow, um, finishing up my training in cardiology. Initially, I trained uh, in internal medicine and pediatrics at Vanderbilt. Um, and then after that, I moved to St. Louis to do my cardiology fellowship training. So this is my final year. And I'm getting excited to get to the end of uh, the training. So that's what brings me to St. Louis. Yeah. So, so you did all your three years of your fellowship here. And are you... Correct. So you're biting at the bit to finish up. When is the <laughs> when's the when's the last day? <laughs> so graduation officially is uh, June the 23rd of 2018. So you know, just about uh, five months away from now. Very cool. Yeah. So I so a previous guest of ours, mm -hmm. Dr. Don Huey, mm -hmm. who I, I think you know her. She knows she yes. knows you for sure, and she was just on the podcast. Little, okay. She uh, her podcast was actually released. Uh, this Monday. Okay. So, and she reached out to me. It was like, Nathan, you need to talk to him. <laughs> and, and, and she, she gave you all sorts of praise yeah. uh, for everything. And That's I'm kind of excited. Kind. Yeah. She's an incredible person. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm excited to hear about your story and share that with our audience. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to go all the way back. So mm -hmm. you were born in Kenya, yes, correct? Sir. In Luwala? Yes. Uh, so yeah, we, we grew up in, um, in Lowala. Lowala is a tiny little village in uh, western Kenya. Um, I'm the third born of six children. Um, so yeah, we grew up in Lowala. Lowala is in uh, western Kenya. So we're about um, two and a half hours away from the probably the third largest city in Kenya called Kisumu. Uh, Kisumu is a big city in the lakeside, Lake Victoria. Um, so we grew up in a tiny little village in, um, you know, in uh, western Kenya. Um, small village, no running water, no electricity. Um, so that's kind of where we, uh, me and my siblings, grew up. And um, you know, no no running water, no electricity. Uh, and really no access to healthcare. Um, so I remember growing up when, when I had malaria or when my brother had malaria, you know, given that the closest hospital would be about a five mile walk down the unpaved road. Uh, so then you get to the main road and then you wait for public transportation. And then that's how you uh, wait for public transportation, then hopefully you will get safely to the nearest hospital. So the nearest hospital would be about 26 kilometers from home. So, you know, probably that's, you know, more than 15 miles away from, away from home. Um, so it would be that, you know, you have a headache and a fever. It's not really clear if it's malaria or if you just have uh, the flu or some common virus. So it would be the same local shop where you buy your soap, you buy your sugar, the bread. Um, that's also where you you buy your medications. And, um, you know, both of my parents were teachers. Um, my dad was a science teacher, taught chemistry, taught biology. Um, so he, he really actually cultivated our interest in science. So he had this uh, big book in our shelf at home called Where There Is No Doctor. And, you know, he, when you developed symptoms, uh, he would be reading from the book and trying to figure out, okay, does it sound like uh, this, these symptoms match up with this kind of an illness? Okay, and if he thinks it, it's malaria, then we would uh, swallow this beta chloroquine pills. <laughs> Uh, but the chloroquine pills, you know, they never worked so well, you know, when you're sick and you 
try to swallow it, it hits the back of your throat and it quickly comes back up. So now the problem was if you don't really swallow your chloroquine pill, then that means it's time for an injection. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, my brother and I were terrified when we would hear um, our dad asking our mother to, you know, sterilize, you boil some water, get the syringe, the needle, sterilize it uh, in boiled water and then get ready for get ready for a chloroquine injection. <laughs> so, you know, just growing up um, in this community where there was lack of access to healthcare, um, rural community, most people were subsistence farmers, um, but it was a fun place to grow up, you know, as long as you are not sick or needed emergent uh, access to healthcare, you know, everybody knows everybody in the neighborhood. Mm. Yeah, um, I was going to ask, is it like a long like history of your family all from that village or has it been? Yeah, so, I mean, grandpa, uh, my paternal grandpa was um, used to be a vet. Okay. Uh, so that's probably the closest of a scientist that we know of <laughs> or somebody <laughs> in medicine. Uh, so he used to be a vet and, you know, people trace back our our roots. Actually, so I'm from the Luo tribe and uh, Luos came from southern Sudan. So, in, you know, in Kenya, there are more than 43 different tribes. Gotcha. And Luo is uh, one of the big tribes in um, in Kenya. And many Luos like to... Uh, remind people that their claim to fame, uh, the former president of the U.S., Barack Obama, his father was actually from the Luo tribe. Okay. So his dad grew up on the other side of the lake from where we are. So m most Luo's like to claim they're somehow related to <laughs> 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 former President Obama and his father. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, um, that's, you know, growing up in uh, this tightly knit community you know if you're hungry if your mom cooked some food that you don't like you wander to your neighbor and you you're welcome you can mm -hmm. just sit down and enjoy the food that they have also prepared <laughs> so it was a lot of fun growing up yeah. um, in yeah. the community so you lived there for 18 years until until college correct yeah so we would actually so both we had a small, Loala Primary School is a tiny little school, uh, so we all would go to school there initially, because, um, you know, it's a small school. Back when we went to school, uh, some of us actually in the lower grades, uh, we would sit under a tree and there would be a chalkboard. Um, so the teacher writes on a chalkboard, we are learning under the tree because there were not enough classrooms for people to sit in uh, under a roof. Um, but then, so my dad uh, used to teach and they would transfer him from school to school. So then uh, I moved around quite a bit with him when uh, he was moving to different schools. So they would find uh, boarding schools for, gotcha. for us to go to. So we would go to boarding school and then when it was holidays, uh, when schools closed, then we come back to work in the farms and take care of the animals. Um, so yeah, we went to we went to boarding schools. You know, the the great thing is that both parents being teachers, they were really interested in education opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. So you know, my mom would take out uh, loans to because going to going to boarding schools was not free. And going to high school was even more expensive. Uh, so, you know, back when we were going to high school, it was it would be about uh, somewhere around five hundred dollars a year to go to to go to high school. Um, so, uh, my brother. So, like I mentioned, we were six kids. Um, I'm the third born. Uh, my brother, who is just a year and a half older than me, is also is also a doctor uh, currently, and we've kind of had a similar path. Um, being interested in medicine. He's actually a gastroenterologist. Okay. Uh, so I kind of followed uh, what he was doing. He went, he, after finishing eighth grade back home, everybody sits for a national examination. Okay. Uh, depending on how well you do, then um, you qualify to either go to the top uh, high schools or kind of a, midi a middle level or kind of the lower level types of high schools. 
And so we were both actually fortunate to be um, asked to join Alliance High School, uh, which is actually close to Nairobi. Uh, Alliance High School is in Kikuyu. Kikuyu town is about 21 kilometers outside of Nairobi. Um, it was a really good high school. Um, so it was expensive, but once you get yourself to Alliance High School, because they picked the top students from all the different regions in Kenya, so there was stiff competition and just some brilliant kids who go to that school. So it was just a very rich learning environment. And uh, upon finishing 12th grade, then again, everybody takes another national examination. Mm -hmm. And depending on how you do on your national exams, then that uh, will determine whether you qualify to go to school of medicine, engineering school, or law school. So it, it's kind of all predetermined. Uh, you may want to go to you know, one of those uh, very competitive professions, but if your grades do not qualify, then you don't get invited to, to go to, uh, to join those professions. So the other neat thing with this high school was that they had um, an exchange program uh, with uh, Brooks High School in Andover, Massachusetts. And actually my brother during his third year in uh, high school, he got chosen to participate in the exchange program. So we would have two students from Brooks High School come to our high school and uh, for a semester and then two from uh, our high school go to Brooks High School. So, you know, typically most people would finish um, high school, then you get called up to go join um, um, college. Um, but after seeing, after Milton got to visit uh, Brooks High School, you know, he got to see some of the higher learning institutions in the Northeast, uh, Harvard, MIT, some of those other institutions. So naturally he got interested in applying to colleges in the US. Mm -hmm. And so actually that's how we got uh, the idea of uh, sitting for our uh, college board examinations and applying to come to college in the US. And so that's how, so at the end of uh, um, 12th grade, you sit for your national examinations, but then we also sat for our SATs. Um, so Milton got um, admitted uh, at Dartmouth College on a full scholarship, and then I followed him about a year later on. Uh, we had both actually already been admitted to uh, Nairobi School of Medicine. So if we didn't come over to the U.S., we would have both been attending um, the School of Medicine in Nairobi because you go straight to um, med school coming from gotcha. high school. So how was that transition going from all your schools in Kenya and then yeah. coming over to Dartmouth for four years of for college? Undergrad. Um, so Milton was actually fortunate because he had actually been to the U.S. for, you know, a semester. So he kind of knew what <laughs> what mm -hmm. it was like. <laughs> uh, as for me, you know, I, when I applied to Dartmouth College, I really was just going through, um, you know, some of the college admission uh, books. Uh, so you read about schools that have the best food, campus is beautiful, <laughs> and Dartmouth seemed to be featuring in most of those. <laughs> so I was like, Dartmouth seems like a cool place. Um, and then uh, Milton sent me some pictures of him playing soccer in front of uh, you know the Baker Library. And I thought to myself, hmm, these pictures of uh, people playing soccer in the summer, this place, I'm loving it even before <laughs> I show up. So. You know, fly to, he he actually came to meet me in uh, Boston, Logan Airport, when I flew in. And, you know, it's just coming from a village, having never flown in a plane before. Uh, so, yeah, it was quite, uh, it was quite a, uh, it, it was quite a dramatic change. Uh, you know, you show up, it's your first winter. So, playing in the, you know, snowball fight for the first time. <laughs> seeing this thing called snow and then the Connecticut River freezing and these are things you just read in uh, geography books and you never thought were real. Yeah. So yeah, it was uh it was a very exciting um time, you know, lots of culture shock, but um you know, simple things like even the food back home, we don't really get to eat that much um 
people in the U.S. eat a lot of protein, a lot of chicken. Yeah. So little things like that and lots of sweets here. <laughs> so <laughs> when I showed up to college, you would go to all these free, f- free food events. There's cake everywhere. Th- that's how they get you to go anywhere. They yes. just, oh, we got an event going on, free for food, <laughs> free pizza. Food. <laughs> yes. So, and because at home, you typically, when, when you have an important guest visiting you, that's usually the time when, you know, you chase after the chicken, you slaughter your own chicken. Uh, so it's usually a big deal. And then to come to the U.S. and going to, uh, going to the dining hall and we can have chicken for lunch, chicken for dinner. <laughs> and I'm thinking, whoa, this is so much chicken <laughs> and there's no big guest coming to visit me. Um, and then just a lot of uh, the sweet food. So I think year one, my teeth suffered quite a bit from, <laughs> from all the sweets. But yeah, I mean, Dartmouth was such such a fun place to be. Um, and so we played soccer, met all sorts of fun friends. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was, a, it was a really, having Milton, I haven't been in the US. And, cause, you know, I thought I bought, I brought warm clothes for the winter. <laughs> None of that. Uh, none of those things you buy in Nairobi, you show up to Hanover, New Hampshire, and all the, the, the wind chill just goes right through. <laughs> so it was great to have somebody who'd been here and, you know, showing me um, the place and telling me about some of the cultural nuances. Yeah. So it was great to have somebody here. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you guys were together for a few years and then mm-hmm. Milton ended up going to Vanderbilt. Actually, we both went to Vanderbilt for medical school. Yes, yes. Uh, was he, he was a year... He was a year ahead of me. Okay. But um, I ended up being behind him by two years because after finishing college, he went straight to med school. While I took a year off, half of it spent doing uh, research at Dartmouth. And half of it is when we were beginning the construction yeah. of the clinic yeah. in Kenya. And that's what I kind of want to transition into right mm-hmm. now, talking about, so it, you guys talk about it a lot, but it was, it, you guys described it as a dream of your father's to start mm-hmm. the first clinic in, yeah. in your hometown mm-hmm. or in, in your village. And um, during that time after your, I guess, started during your senior year of college and, and then you took the time off, mm-hmm. uh, h- how did you two start that and what was like what was that whole process like yeah so it's uh i remember growing up you know it would be that like i mentioned uh being in a village where there was no access to healthcare. so one of the local catholic churches um about every once a month uh there's a nearby you know catholic mission uh, hospital and they would do an outreach to the community uh so Once at the end of the month, you would have uh, the nuns. We used to call them the sisters. So those (laughs) are the those are the um, those were the nurses, and so you know at the end of the month, you see you know hundreds of people showing up. uh, Some people with uh, just diabetic wounds. uh, So they some people come in with um, malaria infection, uh, and these nurses would just tend to all these people in the community who really didn't have access to healthcare. So people in the community kept saying, you know, wouldn't it be great to one day have a healthcare facility in the village, to have a clinic in the village that would serve, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of people who had to wait till, you know, the end of the month for people to show up from the Catholic Mission Hospital to help take care of them. Um, But, you know, and some of the other things, you know, that we remember vividly growing up were, um, you know, when we were, Milton and I were teenagers, uh, one of our neighbors, uh, he lives a few houses away from where we are, um, his mother was in labor. um, And typically most people in the village would deliver their babies under the care of a traditional birth attendant. So these were typically women. Um, they have their heart 
you know, mud walled house, grass thatched. Um, they know traditional medicine, so they have local herbs that, you know, they can boil and they are known to stop uh, bleeding uh, whenever there are complications. Uh, but we remember vividly when uh, Ben's mother uh, was in labor. Uh, they tried to deliver the baby with a traditional bath attendant, but uh, she was bleeding and it looks like there was an obstruction. So the villagers uh, borrowed a wheelbarrow from the local um, head teacher of the school. They put Ben's mother in a wheelbarrow and were walking, you know, five miles down the road to try get to um, try get to the main road. Uh, where they could get public transportation to take her to the nearest hospital. Unfortunately, she bled to death in the wheelbarrow. Never made it to, uh, never made it to the uh, public hospitals. And you know, the following day, people brought her body back in this wheelbarrow. And we remember waking up, and the whole village people were, you know, wailing. Um, these were just some of the things that we grew up with. Um, and, you know, kept thinking, you know, again, just like my dad had mentioned, just like people in the village had wished to one day have a healthcare facility. Uh, so all these were things that we kept in the back of our minds. We wished we would become, we knew we wanted to become physicians, uh, but really the idea of actually building a clinic in the village never crystallized until, uh, you know, my mother... Uh, initially became sick. This was uh, around my second year of college, uh, third year of college, and um, she became sick enough, and there was no healthcare facility, so she had to be hospitalized about 50 kilometers away from home and uh, was diagnosed with HIV. Um, so how it worked was that in order to get antiretrovirals, um, you know, you had to go to the big uh, district hospitals, to get uh, those medications. And they would only give you a few days supply to ensure that you are compliant and you are taking them as directed. Um, so, you know, my siblings who were home at that time, um, my sister had to drop, uh, drop out of uh, pharmacy school. My oldest brother had to drop out of, uh, of a teacher training college to go take care of my mother when uh, when she was sick. And unfortunately, she ended up uh, dying. Uh, this was my, my junior year in college. So at that point, you know, when, when she passed away and we were at Dartmouth, uh, both Milton and I, you know, the most we could do was just to send money home to help with some of the um, buying the medications, her upkeep, and suddenly it hit us that, you know, people were dying, um, and it wasn't my mother was the first one to die of HIV, AIDS complications. Lots of people in the village, across the community, people in their prime were dying. Uh, but when it came to my mother, then suddenly we, s we started thinking and... Uh, we say that, you know, this is becoming, this is now a crisis. So instead of uh, one day we we'll, we're going to become physicians, then Milton Dye started thinking, well, what is it that we can do to, we, we have to do something. What this something is going to be, we didn't really know. Um, and so around that time, when we came to the funeral, I flew back home for the funeral, uh, my dad had actually uh, started meeting with uh, some of the folks in the village. Uh, they formed a village committee to think about um, what would it take to build a small clinic in the village. And our hope was that once we had a clinic, uh, it could one day be a place where people could get their medications. Uh, so you don't have to travel 50 kilometers away in order to get your treatment. Um, so really that's how... Um, they formed a committee, they started um, coming up with a plan and a budget uh, for what it would take to build a clinic. And so my senior year in uh, college, uh, Milton was already a first year in medical school at Vanderbilt. Um, then we were pushing forward. Um, 
So Milton said he would be the logistics guy mm -hmm. uh, working with the village committee and my dad. And he said I would be the fundraising guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, great. Uh, I am the shy one. I will never ask somebody for money unless I'm dying. <laughs> um, so I was like, man, this is a what a what a what a huge what a huge task. Um, but you know, at that point, we said, well, what do we have to lose? We already we already lost our mother. Uh, more people are going to be dying. So, you know, step out there and figure out something. So. Um, January of 2005. Um, so then I started reaching out to friends, our soccer coach, our campus ministry coordinator, and, you know, just talking to them about, okay, we have a dream to build a clinic in our village. Um, people are dying. People are in dire need. And, you know, it was, it was impressive to see how our soccer community, our campus ministry, um, you know, people came around us and um, so started fundraising and, you know, kids would, um, kids who had met me uh, when we were coaching them in soccer would um, empty their piggy banks to go towards building a clinic in our village. Wow. Um, you know, I, I went to a joint campus fellowship in Albany, New York, with the navigators um, that we fellowshiped with during college. And after that one weekend, uh, they dedicated over $8,000 wow. to go towards um, our project of building a clinic in the village. And so <laughs> I remember Milton was getting ready um, to go, because he would meet with his, um, with his mentors at Vanderbilt. Um, Every every medical student was required to do a summer project, and Milton proposed that for his summer project, uh, he wanted to build a clinic in in Loala in Kenya, and you know the village um, the village folks were ready with a project um, and with a budget, but we had no money. So his uh, his <laughs> his advisor in med school. Um, didn't really want to be very discouraging, but kept asking, well, um, how about the money? How are, how, are <laughs> <laughs> how are you going to be doing this? So I call Milton one weekend and I tell him, man, you won't believe it. <laughs> After this one weekend, we have $8,000 to go towards building the clinic. <laughs> and Milton thought I was just pulling his legs. And, you know, when we finally, when he... When he finally believed it, um, suddenly we knew that this really wasn't just a dream, but this was going to take off. Um, so from January of 05 to June 2005, when I graduated from Dartmouth, we had actually raised over $27,000. The initial budget we had was requiring just about $25,000. So we were more than elated to know that we'd been raising funds um, as of June uh, when, when I was finishing college. Uh, unfortunately, just a month before we would uh, graduate uh, from college and begin the construction. Yeah, so about a month, unfortunately, about a month before uh, we graduated from college and when we had set up a time to do the groundbreaking ceremony, at home and then my dad also passed away so you know within less than 18 months we'd lost our dad and our mother and unfortunately neither of them got to witness uh, the groundbreaking or the construction of the clinic um, in the village but you know we as sad as we were as we were beginning the groundbreaking you know we had the hope that this um, this clinic would be to their honor and you know all the sacrifices they had made for us and for the community so and that's why you know when we finished the construction uh when the clinic opened we named it in honor of our dad yeah, yeah. and now you guys celebrated 10 years yes sir. of the 10 years in last april right or mm -hmm. april of 
2017. Uh, yeah, so the clinic opened in April of uh, 2007. Uh, small little, you know, big by village standards because there was no healthcare facility then. Uh, 10 rooms. Uh, by then, we had less than 10 employees. <laughs> <laughs> but now, you know, 10 years later, as of April 2017, uh, when we were celebrating our 10th year anniversary, uh, the place has grown incredibly. Um, you know, talking of 10 employees when we began, now we are close to, we are over 200 uh, uh, employees just in Kenya. About half of uh, half of them um, community health workers. Um, so they are, you could consider them part-time, uh, but then the rest, um, uh, people who are employed working full-time, so we are the biggest employer in the, you know in the in the whole region um and you know now it's uh not a tiny little clinic now it's grown to have a small maternity wing we have a small inpatient facility mm -hmm. um so the place has grown incredibly yeah and in those 10 years time i know uh before, like when you guys grew up, the average life expectancy mm -hmm. in in Kenya or well in in your village was about forty years, mm -hmm. right? And how has since opening the clinic and in those ten years, how have you? I know some of the big areas you were trying to affect were mm -hmm. the problems with HIV mm -hmm. and then a lot of women's health issues and then also women's education were some three big areas that mm -hmm. you guys were trying to affect. Yeah. How, what has been the impact in the last 10 years that you guys yeah. have had? So, you know, with Luala Community Alliance, which is the nonprofit organization that um, we set up to support the work that's going on in Kenya, uh, we figured that tackling the, um, the problems we have in rural Kenya would require a holistic approach and that's what we have tried to do um so you you kind of step back and see we you know milton and i would never be where we are he's currently a gastroenterologist he's here in uh, st louis um so milton is in medicine is a gastroenterologist i'm in medicine um internal medicine pediatrics and now um cardiology uh my sister who follows me is a nurse practitioner wow uh the sister who follows her is finishing her nursing school uh this may wow uh so we have uh one nurse one nurse practitioner two doctors um the oldest is um trying to finish his uh, teacher training mm -hmm. um so i'm i'm just mentioning that to highlight the fact that the role of education. And we were blessed to have parents who really valued education and, you know, warranted for my mother, especially, you know, taking loans and trying to give us the best opportunities in education, which has really opened the way for us to be where we are right now. And knowing that, you know, having an educated, especially woman in the community, is such an invaluable resource. Um, so there's healthcare, but how does it interact with everything else? So if there's lack of education, especially for the girl child, um, the women, um, their level of education in the community was typically much lower than it was for boys. Um, and we know how that negatively affects the community. Um, so one of the things we were striving towards is how do we get the girl child to try to achieve some of the educational um some of the educational um goals that the boys are having um because we figured out that you know simple things like girls not having school uniforms um girls not having clean sanitation uh, materials when they start having their menstrual periods. So around fourth, fifth grade, you would see a dramatic drop in enrollment for the girls. Um, and not having opportunities to go to high school um, because for most of our community, 
girls typically get married, they leave the community, then they have to go to a different community. So most people never valued educating their girls. Um, that's because they would leave their community. And if you have finite resources, you would preferentially educate boys because they stayed in the community and they would take care of their parents when they get older. Mm -hmm. So, y you know, there was preferential treatment for the boys. So we figured um, knowing some of the shining examples of brilliant women like my mother was, how could we work with the girls um, in our non-profit organization to try, you know, just try to get them to a level playing field in terms of offering scholarships for uh, post um, eighth grade education, uh, just uniforms, um, mm -hmm. which are being made by one of the local um, women sewing co-op that was actually founded by my sister Grace, who is currently finishing her nursing school training. Uh, so empowering women in the community to be leaders to be mentors for the young girls, um, giving the young girls hope that they can work hard in school and upon finishing school, they actually can go further with their training. Um, and these are going to be the women that even though they don't stay in the community, whichever community they go to, their kids are going to be well-educated. They will worry about the nutrition of the kids. Um, so it's just a multiplicative effect to have educated mm -hmm. women. So I with the Luala Community Alliance, we are working in terms of improving education opportunities, um, improving infrastructure. I mentioned, you know, lack of clean running water, um, places for people to safely dispose of human waste. Uh, so having safe uh, latrines and toilets or outhouses. So those are some of our public health um, partnerships with some of the local nonprofit organizations and the community. We include the churches, we include the school community in figuring out how do we safely um, capture rainwater, treat it, and then that way kids at school um, the community members, everybody, we, you know, we try to encourage people to come for this public health training. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mention lots of people in the village like playing football or soccer, as we, um, we call it here. Um, so we try to find fun ways in which uh, young people, um, there's a very competitive, uh, we call it the WASH tournament. <laughs> water sanitation and hygiene tournament every year. Now, to be involved in water sanitation hygiene, you have to come for training. Um, in your homestead, uh, you must have at least one functional outhouse or latrine for the for the homestead. Um, clean um, hand washing practices. Uh, so, people come in; they get trained in uh, these practices. And the, you know, the price at the end is to be, um, get your team enrolled to participate in this very fun uh, wash soccer tournament. And all the young people <laughs> are coming in. And so we make it a fun, a fun yeah. event. And at, at the wash tournament, you have people from different communities. Each community, ha each village has their own soccer team. Um, and people are cheering <laughs> and <laughs> stiff competition. And at these uh, wash tournaments, you have thousands of people in the community. So people are coming in for uh, women's health. There are little booths for uh, testing for HIV, little booths for uh, different public health, um, nutrition, education. Um, so like I mentioned, we are working with education, acute healthcare services, um, water sanitation hygiene and working with the community members in terms of uh, how do we raise uh, their potential for earning. Uh, like I mentioned, most people are um, subsistence farmers. Uh, youths have been trying to figure out uh, what kind of um, activities 
can they get involved with? Uh, so they write a proposal, uh, somebody uh, and their friends, they want to have a small project for raising chickens, they can sell the eggs. So all these uh, kind of microfinance projects are also coming up. So, you know, just to to summarize, it's um, with the Loala Community Alliance, it's a multidimensional approach. And um, like, you were, like you had asked uh, before, comparing where we were before we opened the clinic and started the nonprofit organization, uh, you know, some of the major uh, changes and transformation we have seen in the community, um, talking about maternal child health, um, transformation, HIV care, um, education, just to highlight a few of the things. Um, you remember the story I mentioned about Ben and uh, his mother unfortunately dying in, um, in labor. Um, we worked with various partners both in Kenya and here in the US and initially we we built a small maternity wing in um, in the facility. And then we did something very unique. We got the traditional bath attendants to become part of um, the healthcare providers. Um, and the nice thing with the community um, health workers and the traditional bath attendants being part of them is that they had the trust of the community. So the traditional bath attendants would let their clients, the mothers know, nowadays we are delivering our babies in a healthcare facility because one of our goals was to increase the number of uh, deliveries under the care of a trained healthcare provider. That way, if there's a complication, the mother can be attended to uh, in, a, in, a, in an expedient fashion. Um, so before we started, you know, just about 25% of mothers were delivering their babies under the care of a trained healthcare provider. After we built a small maternity wing, we saw the numbers, and this was around 2011, uh, we saw the numbers go up to about 46%. But it's only after we brought in the community health workers and the traditional birth attendants that we actually, our numbers shot from uh, 25%, 46% to 95, 96%. And since 2013, uh, this is 2018, as of, uh, as of now, our numbers have stayed right at about 95, 96% of all the mothers in the whole community, uh, about 20,000 people in the community, delivering their babies under the care of a trained healthcare provider. And this is just a remarkable thing uh, because, you know, if there's a complication, uh, we have ambulance services. Although we don't offer C-sections, um, we can rush somebody to um, to the nearby hospital. Uh, so that's improving uh, maternal child health. Um, think about immunizations. Uh, if you have a baby that's born out in the heart of um, a traditional birth attendant, um, they don't really get the they don't get to have immunizations. Uh, you know, when a baby is born, you want to give um, uh, some of those immunizations that should be given right at birth and uh, on subsequent uh, visits. So, you know, the county average uh, of um, immunizations in our area stands at about 50-55%, um, but because of our strong network in the community, uh, with the community health workers, our numbers of net of the you know the required immunizations have been standing right at about ninety five percent also so that's also another huge uh, cause of celebration um, thinking about HIV um, and how it affects people um, you know the great thing about living in a community like ours is um, Word of mouth is really powerful. Like I mentioned, you know, when traditional birth attendants told mothers, we now deliver babies in a healthcare facility. 
they believe them um, because they've had such strong uh, rapport with them. Um, so it was very impressive to see some of our community health workers who were living with HIV. And now in the healthcare facility, we have partnered with the Ministry of Health and some of the, um, some of the organizations that supply um, treatment uh, and care for HIV patients. So these folks in the community who are openly living with HIV to drive down the stigma and they would, um, you would have mothers who are HIV positive, they are taking their medications, they are living positively and they, you know, one of the mothers delivered their babies after being put on medications that's recommended, delivered their baby at the initial testing, subsequent testing, baby is HIV free. And that's a miracle. Yeah. And um, when this mother makes it known to the community that I am living with HIV, I am taking my medications, here is my baby, and she is also HIV free. Uh, so it's quite amazing to see that now we have 100% of prevention of uh, perinatal or mother to child transmission of HIV over the past few years that we've been working with the community. And that's one of our biggest cause of celebration uh, because knowing that, you know, the new, um, the new findings in the, in the HIV uh, treatment community has been, um, not only do you work on prevention, uh, but treatment now is also being viewed as a way of prevention. You treat somebody, you drive down their HIV viral load, they are less prone to transmit to somebody else. So it, it's been quite impressive to see now there are adults living with HIV, they are able to function. Um, we are working with the youth to prevent uh, spread of HIV. And then to see these mothers who are living with HIV and they're on their medications and to have a generation of HIV free babies um, it's been quite incredible to see. And, uh, you know, just to touch briefly on um, some of the disparities that we were seeing with education achievement. Um, you know, when we began, it was um, having these girls who are dropping off, um, dropping out of school uh, around uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, and now uh, just working with the working with the girls, working with the communities, the teachers, mentorship, just having, you know, talking to them and knowing, uh, is it school uniforms, is it scholarships, uh, the different things that they need for them to perform better. Um, now, actually, in our community, we are coming to a place where there's almost a one-to-one -one, um, uh, ratio in terms of completing eighth grade and people are having um, people knowing that it's not just finishing eighth grade now people want to go to college people want to become doctors people want to become nurses and this is a dream that is now palpable and you can you go talking to the kids in the local community and now girls and boys everybody has had their eyes opened up people are dreaming big um people are excited to give back to the community and it's such an exciting time yeah. to see what's what kind of transformation is happening in the village that's amazing and yeah. a, a couple things i've heard you reference uh before in some previous talks that I, mm -hmm. that you've given uh and i was hoping you can maybe touch on these two points about how um you once said that it's it's important for Africans to solve Africa's problems mm -hmm. um, to create lasting change. And then another point you made was the barriers that finances play mm -hmm. and how far like a certain amount of money can go in 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 African communities like uh, in, in your village. Like mm -hmm. how much fifty thousand dollars can go compared mm -hmm. to how far fifty thousand dollars can go here. Yeah, uh, I, I was wondering if you could reference those two points. 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for us, we, in terms of um, thinking about uh, problems, um, you know, say living in rural Kenya, um, you know, Milton and I grew up in the rural village. We know the people there. We love the place. Um, you know, it's where our childhood friends, just such great memories of growing up there. And um, I think you just have to be willing to uh, willing to listen to the community uh, because I think lasting change takes time. And that kind of transformation, you have to grow with the community. They have to come alongside you so that you don't just do something that people are not willing to take ownership of. Um, and, you know, you have to listen, you have to be willing to listen to the community and hear about, you know, what are some of the subtle things, the way they see things. Um, thinking about how, say, for example, uh, the solution in rural Western Kenya, in Lowala, in the village, will probably be different from somebody who's doing work in a place like Kisumu, which is a big city, or in um, Nairobi, um, the capital. Um, so the solutions that somebody would think about uh, being in a place where it's such a close-knit community, and you know some of the successes we have had with community health workers, Granted, some of those could be replicated in a place like uh, the capital city. Uh, as long as you have strong um, community networking. Um, so I think in order to, in order to have the community, we have to be willing to listen to the people because they typically know some of the nuanced things about how, you know, say you we've uh, some of the examples that we've seen um some of the traps you could fall into would be uh say you come to Lawala there's no running water so you say we are going to build a well for you we have actually seen many communities where if you did not involve the community members and engage them and ask them what can you contribute to towards this solution so say the community members will say, we are going to bring, um, we are going to bring the labor, we are going to bring some of the local materials, and we are going to participate in building this facility. If you see that you have money, uh, it probably won't be difficult to say, I'm going to give you, you know, $20,000, build this well for you guys so you can enjoy this clean water, which is very well-meaning. Uh, the problem is, as we've seen in many communities where, uh, you know, people call them white elephants. Um, you go build a well for the community, say something goes wrong, uh, the tap is broken, something, something really simple. Uh, but since nobody in the community takes ownership of it, um, then, you know, something that was so good, so beautiful, uh, gets left dysfunctional. Um, and that's that's an example of you know a change that you bring to the community, but you don't do it with the community. So I think that's one crucial lesson that we have learned um, being in a place like Lawala. It's it's frustrating after having come to <laughs> the U.S. and know knowing how things work fast. You know, there's a schedule and. <laughs> you know, things get done um, we have to remind ourselves to kind of step back and say okay uh, the Kenyan way sometimes is just go slowly <laughs> um, they say in Swahili haraka haraka haina baraka you know hurry hurry has no blessing and you kind of have to step back and you know sometimes you have to slow down the people that you're partnering with and say hey I know this is what we're trying to achieve, but um, you know, just give the give the community time to let them um, come alongside in the journey. Um, so I think humility, listening mm -hmm. to the community, and you know, not just being in a rush, um, yeah. as one of the key lessons to keep in mind. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in 
I also heard you talk and talk about your, your faith life mm-hmm. and your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. How is that throughout your life journey so far? What role has God played in it and everything mm-hmm. that you're doing today? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think faith has been very, very important in, m- I would say, kind of throughout my life. Um, I think both Milton and I will... Um, uh, remember really how my mother was a very strong woman of faith um and so she you know she always prayed she always taught us how to pray um uh, you know we just put your faith in god um and i think it's some of those things that you you are you're brought up with they stick with you and you know some of the lessons that you learn um, in faith and just seeing some of the uh, great things that, you know, people of faith have done and you think of how, you know, when uh, the opportunities you've been given, uh, the blessings that you have and how you also have that opportunity to share the blessings. Um, You think of, you know, to whom uh, much has been given um much is also required um you know the golden rule trying to treat others uh just as well as you would hope to be treated um so you know we i think faith has always been such a great part of how we were raised and the the cool thing about growing up in a place like Lawala um almost everybody you know people would people would go to church together. Uh, so everything people do, ever, the church was such a strong um, support system. And, you know, I remember seeing how mom would, um, you know, after church, um, they would go ministering to, uh, say, our neighbor who was sick and wasn't able to come to church. And, you know, in the afternoon, they go pray with them, sing, encourage them you know, take them uh, some food. Um, so just seeing how being in this closely knit community and seeing how people live their faith uh, to try lift other people up, encourage other people. And so I think we kept that with us uh, growing up. And, you know, fast forward, at, you know, a time of crisis after losing losing my mother, who was such a uh such a hero to me um a spiritual a spiritual hero to me and in that time of crisis and thinking about how you know there's suffering uh but there's hope there's redemption and so taking a leap of faith i remember w- you know when when milton said that i would be the man in charge of fundraising <laughs> knowing how how shy I was and how I never wanted to be asking people for money, but knowing that at some point you have to take a leap of faith, and it's not that you are doing it, it's by God's uh, strength um, that we are going to do things that are much bigger than we ever imagined or thought. Um, so just and seeing that you ask God, you trust him. <laughs> the lights. <laughs> and the lights are gone. <laughs> Must be a 30-minute timer. Cause <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just knowing that uh, when you take that leap of faith and you, you trust in God um, and knowing that we have asked him for help so many times, uh, we have seen so many times when we thought that this project was going to fail uh, but God would send somebody uh, to lift us up to give us a new idea to just just make things work so for us it's been such a tremendous journey of faith and seeing how you trust in him and he keeps blessing and he keeps blessing even more abundantly than as it's written than all you could ever ask or imagine. So, I mean, to me, it's been a tremendous journey of faith. And to hear how our journey of faith has actually also blessed many other people who are 
saying, well, you guys have been such a blessing. I want to do something like this in my community. I want to give back to my community in one way or another and to see how, you know, how faith is just um, just a multiplicative, um, it's an infectious thing mm. I- in yeah. a beautiful way. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And so I only have a couple more questions okay. and they'll be, they'll be quick. <laughs> and but I mean, before there are questions that I ask everybody who's been on the podcast since yeah. the very beginning. And before I jump into them, I just want to say uh, first, thank you again mm. for coming and, and sharing your story with the future healthcare community. Mm. Uh, it's been great to hear and I I love everything you're doing. Like it's it's very inspirational to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I you may not like to always take recognition for that, but it's it's a great thing to hear and recognize like yeah. what you and your family have done. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for that and sharing it with us today. Thank you, thank you for thank you for having me and for giving us this opportunity to share our story. Which you know it's um, a small small story coming from a small community, but um, like the parable of the mustard seed, you know, a small story, um, potential of blessing so many. Um, and we appreciate that uh, you'll share this story with with your audience. Yeah. And hopefully it will be a blessing to them. Of course. Mm-hmm. So the second to last question is, if you had all the power of the world and you can change one thing about the future healthcare, what would that be and why? <sighs> <laughs> Uh, I should have spent more time thinking about this. <laughs> one. Uh, <laughs> wow, one thing mm-hmm. um, about the future of healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think. Um, I probably would have a few things to like. There could be there. There's a few, there's but a what's few, one of the few? One of, one the, of few. the few. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the few that I would love to see um, is really um, I think it's especially in hopes for the young generation, hopes for our children. Um, having seen how we were forced to grow up as as orphans, you know, s- having seen the devastation by HIV AIDS. Um, I think to me, one of the great dreams I have for Sub-Saharan Africa um, and many other places is to see a generation of um, kids, just a, an HIV AIDS free generation um if that would be one thing that we could achieve in the several coming years um so hiv free generation uh number 2 is more of kind of a broader uh thing that um you know how to um how to tackle poverty and uh w- whenever i talk about poverty i'm thinking of um just opportunities of education um poverty has such a terrible way of retarding um just dreams uh, dreams of um you know you never know you could achieve um opportunities of education you never know how how many great people we could have if they had opportunities to be educated like we did. Um, and for many people in in Lowala, in many parts of rural um, Africa, it is just lack of opportunities for education, poverty. So to me, just I think that's becoming one of my exciting... Um, topics to 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 figure out uh, i know there are many smart people who are thinking about eradication of poverty um but i think that's going to be one exciting thing to keep an eye on and see how how we could uh give give young people these great opportunities through education yeah yeah 
And now the final question mm-hmm. is with everything, all the experiences you've had and, and now going through your, your fellowship here mm-hmm. at, at SLU, um, what is some words of advice that you would give to the next generation of healthcare leaders? Yeah. Um, so what of advice? I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of dedication. Um, it's such a unique opportunity that we are afforded to be able to take care of, of patients, take care of people and their families in such a time of need. Um, so as healthcare providers to just keep that in mind and know how fortunate we are. Um, so, you know, the hard work, the dedication, um, thinking about, um, thinking about, uh, families and, um, and, uh, the patients. Uh, I think one thing that, um, uh, the great healthcare providers that I admire, uh, they are good teachers. And they are teachers not just to medical students and other training um, healthcare uh, students, but also great teachers to the patients and their families. Uh, there's nothing better than having your patient know what is going on with them. So instead of just rushing through, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to prescribe you medications, but to step back and make sure the patient understands uh, what's going on with them. Why is it that you should be doing this or staying away from this? So just to remember to be great teachers uh, and bring along the patients and the family uh, family members. And then finally, just, um, you know, partnerships and collaboration. Uh, if there's one thing that we have learned um, in our work in rural Kenya, um, they in the village, uh, we there's always this saying that it takes a village to raise a, a child. Um, and for us, the Lowala Community Alliance, it has taken the global village um, to really make this work. So the partnership with folks here in the US, folks back in rural Kenya, folks in Nairobi, other parts of Kenya, and other parts of the globe. Uh, So that kind of partnership and knowing how it's going to be partnership with folks in media, it's going to be partnership with uh, people in law and advocacy, it's going to be partnership with you know, the engineers, the people who will work on the infrastructure. So you you may be a good healthcare provider, but, you know, stepping back, like I mentioned, in the holistic approach to improving the, um, the health of a community, it really does take that holistic approach. So partnerships are going to be key, and we have to be humble enough to be willing to listen to and invite those other people to work closely with us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fred, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you guys go. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, make sure to subscribe, leave a five-star review, and then share this podcast out with your friends to bring them into this community, bring them into this journey with us together. If you're interested in learning more about Fred and what they're doing at the Luala Health sorry, the Luala Community Alliance, please check the show notes or go to our website, wearethefuturehealthcare.com. While while you're there, go sign up for our newsletter, The Health Report, which is delivered to you every Tuesday. Also follow us on Facebook, Instagram at The Future Healthcare, on Twitter at Future Health. And you, you stay connected with all of us through all those platforms and let's continue this conversation on how we can make an impact in this world. And now with that said, I want you to go out and have a phenomenal day, learn something new and together, we can create a better future of healthcare. My name is Nathan Dollinger, and I'll be here next time at the Future of Healthcare podcast.